Science is for everyone. Science is for everyone. Science is for everyone. C two S T. C two S T. Thank you for joining us tonight. My name is Denise Hernandez, and I'm the program manager with the Chicago Council on Science and Tech, or C2ST. Welcome to tonight's program, Latinidad in STEM, Navigating the Landscape. This program is, pre is presented to you by the Chicago Council on Science and Tech in partnership with Horizon Therapeutics, the Association for Women in Physics, and Instituto Cervantes. This program is generously sponsored by Hor Horizon Therapeutics. We would like to welcome a recording of opening remarks from Teresa Jorge on behalf of Horizon, who makes it possible for us to host programs like these. We can also explore Latino identities. During this Hispanic Heritage Month, we know that one of the pan ethnic term Hispanic meaning a person whose cultural traditions originate from Spain does not adequately, adequately convey the approximately 62 million of us with complex and distinct identities. I look forward to our discussion. In closing, I wanted to share my own lived experience since today's event is not just important to Verizon and all of you gathered here today. It's personal for me. As a first generation Cuban American, I grew up in a Spanish speaking home. Before I started kindergarten, I was taught to read and write Spanish by my Cuban grandmothers. Once I learned English in school, my family depended on me to translate for them. As I grew up and started to think about which career to pursue, it was difficult to find mentors I would identify with, and I lacked the support needed to navigate the college education system. I feel we have made advances in empowering Latino women, such as myself, to pursue an education in what we are passionate and talented in. Science and technology is certainly an area where we can continue to open the avenues for more diverse talent to excel. On behalf of Horizon, I thank all of you for joining us today and know that we all look forward to today's lab dialogue. Thank you. Thank you again to Teresa for her astute, thought provoking remarks. The Caribbean is a joint city, and we choose to inspire and engage all citizens of society about science and tech and its contributions to society. We're delighted to be entering our 15th year of offering science and tech programs, such as this one, to the public. To ask questions, visit c2st.cnf.io for answers after the presentation and, or after the, during the panel rather, and visit c2st.org to learn more about upcoming programs and to donate. Our staff will also be checking C2ST TV YouTube Live and Facebook Live for your questions. Again, to ask questions directly, you'll go to c2st.cnf.io. I have the pleasure of introducing Alejandra Frausto Aceves, Dr. Giselle Sandy, and Dr. Daniel Morales Doyle, Today's amazing panelists, very briefly, you can learn more about them at c2st.org and c2st.cnf.io. If we could enter the stage, that would be great. If the panelists can come up to the stage, please. Alejandro Frausta Seves is a science teacher and educational leader currently working on a PhD in learning sciences at Northwestern University. In 17 years as an educator, Alejandra has served in various roles, including teaching science and other content areas from sixth grade through, through adult students in an alternative setting, working as a curriculum coach and associate principal and leading service learning and leading service learning for the third largest district in the US. Her research examines transformative collective learning in K through 12 science education, teacher collectives and inter interdisciplinary teams and school leaders. Within these contexts, her work prioritizes intergenerational and community-based projects that build towards expansive and agentic present futures. Dr. Giselle Sandy has more than two decades of experience in the National Laboratory Complex. Her research interests include nuclear forensics, nanoscale engineering, and material for energy storage. Giselle is the Chemical Sciences and Engineering Division Operations Lead. In that role, she plans, directs, and coordinates supportive services and or organizational operations and activities with a focus on technical responsibilities and policy or strategy implementation. 
She coordinates communications between functions, improves operational processes, executes projects, supports information flow and operational planning. She also provides technical leadership for facilities within the division. And finally, Dr. Daniel Morales Doyle is an associate professor of science education at the University of Illinois Chicago. His work examines the potential for science education to act as a catalyst for social transformation, specifically in the context of high school science curriculum, teaching, and, te and teacher education. His focus is on engaging youth in learning science and learning to critique science in order to, in order to construct communities that are more just and sustainable. He was a high school teacher in the, in the Chicago Public Schools for more than a decade before coming to UIC. Please join me in welcoming our panelists as they will open the floor with some brief remarks. Hello, my name is Alejandra Frausto Aceves, and I'm starting my second year at Northwestern, working towards a PhD in the learning sciences. Early in my teaching career, someone snidely commented to me after learning I was a science teacher, what I now know as George Bernard Shaw's words, those who can do, those who can't teach. Uh, while those words were meant to sting then, they give me pause now as to what we consider the work and responsibility of science or STEM teachers. 18 years ago, I became a science teacher and set out to teach science in a way that I longed for, but had never experienced in schooling myself. Just as education is inherently social and thus also cultural and political, so is everyday life and its intersections with science. As a science teacher, I didn't want students to think of scientists as people who were removed from the world in a lab. For me, science was never removed from my life the way my science teachers seemed to imply when only certain things were considered scientific. I became fascinated and curious about science at a very early age, hearing stories from my dad about chemistry in his two years as a student of chemical engineering in Mexico, from metallurgy talks among my family members who were jewelers in Mexico, seeing and experiencing sobadas, teas, and ointments that didn't come from a pharmacy, seeing my, plants, my parents plant and harvest food, and seeing my grandfather and uncles working with gears of watches and bikes. So I longed to have a science class where students could hear the stories and struggles of people of color, a space that acknowledged not just that we existed, but acknowledged our excellence, our thoughts, and our contributions too. Just as I wanted my genius um, and ancestral history reflected back to me in the textbooks that I was assigned to read in school. But I also wanted a science class where, where our learning went beyond the test. And from my experiences as a student, learning and knowing didn't happen just because someone told me. Learning and knowing needed to be accompanied by doing and trying things myself. So I wanted to make accessible all the equipment and the instruments at my disposal so that youth could tinker and could discover things and learn about the natural world around them act upon it and see themselves as dynamic or active parts of it. From my perspective as an experienced science teacher and a budding learning scientist, it's resoundingly clear that we cannot and should not separate teaching and knowing from doing, as George Bernard Shaw, Shaw's words imply. Instead of that deficit view, teaching is a cultural, transformative, and intellectual act. And as a STEM teacher, and a STEM teacher, is invaluable to the enterprise of STEM, to society, and to the types of worlds we dream or imagine and build. But what would we be working towards in STEM? Why are we learning science in schools? What will we be doing with what we learned in classrooms? As a new teacher, I was eager to jump in, try things, and use science to improve our communities. But I quickly realized that I didn't know what my students, parents, or community members wanted from their science education. And I couldn't assume I knew because I was Latina too. I've learned over the years ways of inviting the voices of families and communities into the classroom to not just collect data, but to inform the design of experiments and the posing of questions for investigation. 
Together with other science teachers in Chicago, I've learned that we can reimagine science education towards ends that affirm the wealth of communities and empower and protect its members while also practicing and learning rigorous science. I wanna share, share a quick example from my classroom to better illustrate what I mean. I led a project with my sixth graders, though I have taught high school as well, in which we investigated the peeling paint from the viaducts in our neighborhood, concerned that the peeling paint on the ceilings had dangerous levels of lead. My students and other community members, including my children and I, walk under those viaducts every day to and from school. Several students had identified the viaducts as ugly or contaminated in a previous assignment in which they were asked to walk around in their community. Conducting this investigation with my students was doing science, but it was also co-investigating and co-authoring a study with them. After we designed and collected and analyzed our samples with the help of a university scientist, these sixth graders from the south side of Chicago in a predominantly Latina school wrote a letter to their older woman inviting her for a presentation to learn about our study, including our findings and recommendations. After the presentation, a student named Carlos shared he was proud of having presented. He had fun, he learned a lot, and explicitly projected the values of professional scientists as including care for their community. Carlos also compared his involvement to preparing for his future career, saying, it was nice because my dream is to be a scientist. And just like soccer players start when they're really little, this is my practice. I invite us to imagine together how we might pick up on Carlos's vision of connecting engagement with our communities and love for our families as part of the heart of STEM and a collective goal que vale la pena. Thank you. Good evening, everybody. So my name is Daniel Morales Doyle. I work um, as an associate professor of science education at UIC. Um, I want to thank Denise for organizing this event and framing it in a really thoughtful way where both STEM and Latinidad are categories or concepts that deserve some reflection or interrogation. So as a science educator, um, people usually expect me to be like, yay, STEM. Um, but I think it's actually really important that we ask questions about the STEM enterprise. Questions like for who or for what does the STEM enterprise operate? The dominant way of thinking about these issues is the diversity, equity, and inclusion frame or DEI in STEM. But I think we need to challenge the idea that the enterprise of STEM as it currently exists is something that all of us want to be included in. Um, and so I'll say more about that in a moment because first I also wanna address this notion of Latinidad. Um, that's the theme of the night, especially as it relates to me. Um, if I'm honest, I'm a little uncomfortable being on this panel uh, because I don't think I'm a good representative of the Latinx experience in STEM, even though I also don't think that any one essential experience exists. Um, mi apellido Morales comes from my mother. My last name Doyle comes from my father. Three of my four grandparents are actually of Irish descent, my dad's parents and my mom's mother. So my mom's father was from a small group of people called Los Isleños who came from the Canary Islands to Louisiana um, when it was a colony of Spain. And somehow they maintained their language and their community over a period of several centuries. Um, growing up here in Illinois in the 80s and 90s, I didn't really understand that history very well, but I knew that my family history and my last name Morales kind of put me in this broad category of Hispanic right, um, which I heard that in the introduction was troubled. And so as an adult, I learned that this Hispanic category was added to the U.S. Census the decade before I was around in, the, in 1970. Um, and it was intended to be that intentionally broad and vague because it was a compromise between several different communities that had different interests and political stances and in some cases didn't have all that much in common, um, except for that they wanted to be recognized as a federal government by the federal government as experiencing discrimination and marginalization and as deserving of resources, right? So we're talking about Mexican communities, mostly in the Southwest, um, Puerto Rican and Dominican communities, largely in the Northeast, um, Cuban and other Caribbean communities in, in Florida. Um, and so this was an awkward coalition. Um, and so I, not everybody agreed with this compromise that was made to, to come up with the term Hispanic and put it on the census. 
Um, so, uh, you know, in the years since the last co couple of decades, as folks from within the communities have tried to emphasize connections to, to Latino America instead of to Spain, the name of the broad category has shifted from um, Hispanic to Latino, Latinx, Latine. And as I've been working and teaching and living in, in Latinx communities here in Chicago over those decades, I've wondered whether I fit into those categories at all as they've shifted. Um, I'm very conscious of the white privilege I experienced that most other people in my neighborhood don't. Um, I see my work in my life as trying to figure out what solidarity with the Latin American diaspora means in, in a U.S. context of white supremacy, anti-Blackness, settler colonialism, and U.S. imperialism um, that continues to exist in different forms across the Americas. Um, so now I'm going to go back from that Back to STEM for a moment. So my family and I live on the southwest side, right between the two official community areas known as Chicago Lawn and West Lawn. Um, I work with schools and science teachers in that area and around the city trying to figure out how we can do what we call youth participatory science projects that address issues of environmental racism. So part of the teaching and learning that we do involves using the EPA's toxic release inventory, which is an online tool where you can look up local polluters. Um, and so in our neighborhood, one of the major polluters um, that we identified using that tool is a chemical plant at 71st and Pulaski. And so I've been collaborating with a chemistry teacher at our neighborhood high school named Tomas Roski. And this neighborhood high school, 94% of the students are Latinx, most of whom have roots in Mexico. And so um, as we've been working on this project, um, the teacher showed me, sent me a picture of the school's baseball program. And this chemical plant bought an ad in the school's baseball program. So on one page, you had the roster for the baseball team. And the other page, you had this ad talking about how they produce inorganic chemical catalysts um, that are used in the petroleum refining and specialty petrochemical industries, right? So we actually used that, why is this in our baseball program as a starting point for a project with students. Um, but looking at that plant has also caused us to kind of dive into the history of the company because we started wondering like, who is this company and is it a local company? And so we started on our own and with students looking into the history of the company. And we found that it's a huge corporation that was founded by a wealthy landowner from Ireland who moved to Peru in the mid 1800s. And he made his initial fortune shipping bat and bird poop back to Europe as fertilizer, guano, right? And then his heirs, right? So he made a fortune that way. He eventually became the mayor of New York City, actually. He was the first Catholic mayor of New York City. Um, and his heirs took advantage of US government subsidies during World War II to basically use that fortune to enter the chemical industry. And so they spent the mid 20th century buying up all these chemical plants around the world, right? And so over the last few decades, this company went bankrupt because of all the settlement payments they had over their role in the asbestos disaster. Um, and then continued to run all their chemical plants and have paid tens of millions of dollars in fines to the EPA all around the U.S. Um, in the last few decades. So <clears throat> this is a company that was built through the colonization of Latin America and is now polluting Latinx communities here in the U.S., right? And so we teach chemistry as one of the three required subjects in high school, right? I, I think all of us up here are chemists, right, by training. We all have degrees in chemistry. And so um, when we look around our neighborhood and we ask, where is chemistry done? Of course, people around the neighborhood are making wonderful sense of the materials and the chemicals around them in lots of cool everyday ways from cooking to understanding weather and, 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 and lots of everyday things. But when we ask like, where is STEM actually happening? Where are professional people with STEM degrees working in our community? It's in this plant, right? It's in this chemical plant. And so when we say we want to diversify STEM, we, when we're teaching chemistry to, at the school where 94% of the students are Latinx, are we saying these are the paths we want you to go, right? We would like you to work in, in, in a plant like that. It gives me pause because most of the folks who work in STEM don't have these romanticized careers where they're working in university labs to pursue their own curiosities, right? Even those of us who work at universities, often the work is funded by industrial or military sources, right? So. Um, I want to kind of conclude by encouraging us to, to keep reimagining STEM, right? And to push even beyond DEI when we talk about STEM and Latinx communities and other marginalized communities. I don't want my children or my students to be just kind of included and swallowed up by an enterprise that's extractive, unjust, and, uns and unsustainable. Um, how can we think instead about approaches to STEM that might build a world 
where the U.S. doesn't exploit Latin America, um, where we can open up STEM, not just to Latinx people, but also to the epistemologies of the South. Instead of chasing better living through chemistry, right, the famous DuPont slogan, we can embrace the Latin American concept of, of when we view, for example. Right. So instead of the STEM pipeline, I want to encourage us to think about um, STEM education as a catalyst for change. Thank you very much. So they are obviously very well prepared. <laughs> so I am um, um, I just going to ask you, where do you think I'm from, from my accent? People know, some of you know, but just going to see if someone can guess where I'm from. Yes. All right, good guess. One more, two. Yes. Another good guess. When I ask this question to my students um, in the chemistry lab, most of them say Europe. Um, and probably because I really, some people tell me I, if I walk in the street, um, I don't look like a Latino. Right. Some they, they say maybe Spain, maybe even Poland. A lot of them say Poland or Russia. Right. And, and this speaks of the stereotypes that we have of Latino communities and Latinos. I was born in Costa Rica and my family actually uh, were farmers. Um, my uh, grandfather was a coffee uh, plant. You know, we have coffee farms. And um, since I was actually about six, seven years old, I used to go with him to hang out in the summertime when we didn't have school and hang out with him and learn really the value of good work. Um, I am the first person in the family who went to college. Um, I grew up in a very small community. Now it's a large community, but when I was growing up, it was a very small community, practically all farmers. Um, and you see pictures of Costa Rica and you see the ox carts, you know, carrying coffee beans. That's how I grew up. And um, so I learned really very, uh, early, very early on when I was young that although I love to be there and, you know, help my family, I could have done different things. And so for me, uh, education at the very early age was what I actually wanted to do. And in fact, I wanted to be a science teacher, believe it or not. I really love education. And when I was growing up, I used, you know, I'm home, very excited about what I learned and used to tell my mom and grandma, I want to be a science teacher. When I was in high school, my chemistry teacher um, said to me, well, maybe how about something different? I said, what's there, right? So it speaks about the, the lack of role models, right, in, in, in our society, well, at least in our, my community at the time. And I will elaborate more about what I mean by that and why I do to help others, you know, um, dream. Uh, of their future. So she said, how about scientists? And I would say, what a scientist do, right? So again, completely not understanding what it meant. What it meant. So she really took upon herself to um, explain me what a scientist do and, and the option that I had to obviously go to college to get um, an education in chemistry and then explore options to come and do postgraduate. So imagine a person who was at the time, 16, 17 years old in high school, thinking about someone telling you to, you could go to another country and specialize in and get a master's or PhD. Completely a very, you know, it, it was nothing. I could not even understand what she meant. Um, but the fact that she actually was my first actually academic mentor is what really brought me to, you know, think about or what made me think about that I had a lot of potential that I can actually do. Um, I can come to another place or even in Costa Rica, we have an excellent school system, uh, but we don't have PhDs, typically people stopping master's degrees. Um, and so growing up in a family that was really, um, you know, farmers, very limited education, but th what they taught me was the value of integrity and hard work. And so those are the cores that I carry through in, you know, with, to my family and my students as well. So when I came to the United States, of course, I came to do my PhD, huge shock, right? Different system, language was very limited, um, going to the cafeteria and pointing 
I want this. And sometimes I didn't even know what it looked like or taste. <laughs> so not the typical food that I used to uh, like. A very different culture. Um, I remember going to the international uh, office and and one one seminar we had and the, uh, the directors there said to, to us, the international students, when people in the United States ask you, how are you? You should not tell them your story, <laughs> the whole story. They're asking really to say, good, how are you? Good, and then go, <laughs> right? So that was like, they really don't want to know how I feel. <laughs> no, they really don't, <laughs> right? So that was one of the things, a cultural shock that, you know, Latinos are very embracing and we really want to learn how you, how you are. And so those are the things that I started to learn very early on. But it wasn't really something that I felt comfortable. I really wanted to help others. And so very early on in graduate school, and after I, I graduated and, and went to Argonne to do a postdoctoral uh, fellowship, I decided that one of the things that I wanted to do with my life was to lift others. And so I, um, I started working at Argonne, and we founded the Hispanic Latino Club. And the mission of the Latino Club, uh, still now, is actually to help those students who are from underrepresented areas in the Chicago area um, to know that there are people like them, people who were brought like them, people who has families like them, that they can actually, with support, it's not just hard work, but support. With the correct support, they actually can um, move on into the lives that they wanted to live. You mentioned about in your communities where students typically end up in this particular factory, right? So the idea that when we bring students to Argonne is to say there are more possibilities than just what you see in your communities. And it's nothing wrong what you see in those communities, but if you go outside of your community and do a learn, you can help, you can come back to your communities and help more. And so that was the first thing I did at Argon, really to establish the Hispanic Club along with other people. It was just me, of course, right? It was a group of people that really put their heart on and worked hard. Um, that was my first, I would say, mentoring. And then I became very active in an organization that is called Great Minds in STEM. Um, there is a national organization and their mission is same, lift up the Hispanic community students who otherwise would not really be able to do uh, or to dream of their careers. Um, I have been, uh, you know, uh, a, reci a, re a recipient of their um, some of the awards. But the main thing is they dedicate about five to six million dollars a year to provide a scholarship for those students, um, and it has been amazing to really see the transformation of many of those students and going back to their mm -hmm. communities and help as well. Um, so in, in the local level too, um, I live in Glen Allen. So it's, um, it's a wealthy community, um, but I have done, I, ha I was part of the board um, of the um, board of, um, excuse me, the school board. And the reason why actually I decided to be part of the school board was because there were Hispanic families that they didn't know what to do. Literally, they don't, they didn't even speak uh, English. So my role, I wanted to make sure that they could count on me to um, come and even work and, and translate for them, right? Help them to navigate the system, the school system for them and for their children. Um, in particular, um, many of the families like myself have uh, children with special needs. And so imagine someone in this country, not knowing the language, with a child or two who have special needs and not be able to understand what they can or not do or what resources are for them. So as it's one of the missions, my personal missions as well, is to help the Hispanic community that unfortunately um, do not know really what is for them, or, you know, in terms of disabilities as well. And so my work at Argonne is, um, I, I've been very blessed to, to have married functions at Argonne. Um, and I started as a postdoc, became a scientist. Uh, now I'm doing my administration, but in between Argonne, I work at Rush University Medical Center as well. And my function there was as a director of mentoring programs. Um, and a lot of the things that I did was also to work with the communities around uh, Rush to help this community become um, so I was translating for them as well, too, um, in many of the projects that the, the Rush has for the community in the west side and the south side. 
So um, I believe strongly that each of us are responsible for the, our, the future of our communities. And um, we should engage in that because as just as I had mentors throughout my life to help me, um, I feel strongly to pay it forward. And uh, um, our community is a strong community. There's a lot of really smart people. They just need uh, resources and others to believe in them. definitely a lot to think about. And now we would like to open the floor for some questions from our audience, uh, also as well as our online audience. Uh, one member from our online audience asks for, this is for Alejandra, how can we encourage more teachers to bring community voices into the classroom? That's a really good question. I mean, I think that it's not just going to be about convincing teachers, which is I think what some people try to think like, oh, we just need to show teachers these possibilities and their change because there are people above them who dictate the textbooks that they should use, the sequence that they should be teaching, um, even the types of assessments that they can imagine. And so as long as we're not also addressing those other areas, um, it's gonna be difficult for teachers who even want to, right? Um, I've been in different, different sides of that myself. Like I've, I've been in schools where that was a part of the norm, right? Like we learned for the community, you know? And, and so that type of environment is very different. It's much more collective and interactive and interdisciplinary. And I've been in schools where it's, you know, we need students to learn this because we want them to complete this dual language, language program and just make sure you, you stay the course, right? But I think ultimately, um, beyond even just the teachers and talking to administrators and changing policy, just by opening the doors to community, we can have more of this, right? Um, after I left the classroom, I was leading service learning for Chicago Public Schools. And a big part of that work, we were trying to imagine how every teacher can see themselves as a civics teacher, right? How it's, it's all our responsibilities in all disciplines to not just teach subjects, but to also see how those things, how those subjects live in the world. Because ultimately, I mean, all of us were in classrooms where students asked, why are we learning this? And if our answer keeps going back to just tests or to some future. Um, that's not good enough anymore. I think young people want to do things now. And, you know, and I, I don't think um, they should be limited in what they can do because we don't think that they're um, able to, you know, so it, it's a lot, it's, it's a lot of different, I feel like I gave a complicated answer, but there's a lot of different ways ultimately, right? There's a lot of different work and a lot of different things people can contribute towards reimagining a different type of way to teach science. Absolutely, and on that note, I recently heard a quote that said, there's more technology in the red light cameras on the Southwest and South Side than there are in the classrooms um, in that part of the city. So um, on that note, how can we use science or science education to imagine different modes of living? Further, how can we, how can science education be used to foster transformative thinkers? Um, so I, a big part of that for me is when we teach science, recognizing um, it as one of many ways of knowing and understanding the world and recognizing its strengths and limitations and always putting it in context, right? So not expecting that we're going to solve complex problems by engineering our way out of them, right? I mean, I think one of the key examples that we see all the time it, it, it are big, huge, complicated issues like climate crisis or pandemic, right? It, it, you know, I mean, the pandemic makes it abundantly clear that we've had effective vaccines for some time now, and that's not bringing an end to the pandemic by itself. The, the science and technology are never gonna give us the solution, right? So I think the first part of reimagining the world using science education is recognizing the limits of the sciences and recognizing that we need to be thinking about the sciences in context with other ways of knowing and understanding the world, other ways of knowing and being in the world. Um, because I think too often, you know, this is a thing when we push STEM, 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 we're also subtly communicating the ideology that STEM will save us um, and STEM won't save us, right? We need political, social, community, you know, solutions to complex problems. And of course, 
science and engineering and mathematics are going to then play an important role, but they're going to do so, you know, in concert with, with other ways of understanding and with other ways of working together. I want, I'd like to comment on that too. Yesterday I was teaching, I think I had one of the best moments in my life teaching. I was, I finished teaching my class and one Latino girl, uh, came and, and said, can I speak to you? And I said, of course. I was thinking maybe I graded the report too hard and she's asking me for extra points, right? So, you know, she actually had a very good uh, question for me and question I actually comment. She told me, you command the class very well and you look like you have a lot of authority when you speak. And she said, this is the first time I see a Latino person do that. It might have been very hard for you to be where you. I'm not going to comment on that because it has been, <laughs> but she recognized that. And, and I said, yes. And I said, but just like I did, I'm sure you will. And I offered you to take you under my wings and we'll work together. She explained me other things that were going on in her life. Um, and so, and I talked to her about being a human as well. So you talk about the STEM is not going to solve all problems. STEM will not. But we have to also uh, think about, you know, making people work together and, you know, teaching to be a human being, first of all. And then a, a human being that loves to do science and love to do more things. So I think we many times push so much that we forget the nature. We forget the core that we have to actually collaborate. And, and I talk about ethics a lot in my class. But I don't care if you forget something, but I want you to know that you will be a great person when you see your patients or when you do that. Um, so I, I, I felt yesterday was one of the probably more, 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 one of the best moments I have in my life teaching because this student really made me recognize that it hasn't been easy, but I still can make change. I can make an impact in their lives. If I could add just really quickly, just to, um because this really made me think of a lot of what I'm working on right now. Um, you know, I mentioned the viaduct project I was doing with my sixth graders. Well, you know, we we did the investigation. We found high levels of lead. They presented to the older woman. And then we went into this political game of whose property is this? This is private property. The city can't remediate this. You know, they were the railroad company started asking for more testing. So did the city. And so if I had just and then, you know, if this was just bound to the science, then where would that leave the students, right? They would have done all that work. They would have felt like this is dangerous. We want this remediated. And then I would have said like, well, you know, back to science class, we we won't be able to follow through with the older woman because that's a civic issue or that belongs in history class. And so it doesn't belong here. And so I think that that really makes me think of like, what are we, what do our students understanding about science? when we tell them those things in class, right? That's not really how things live in the world and that's not really how change happens, right? I'm, I'm not gonna do a project like this and, and all of a sudden we're in the papers and we had a success within months. It takes years of organizing and we're still working on getting it, rem getting it remediated. And I think that that's where sometimes we have a misunderstanding of what hope and social change can look like, right? Um, and we do a disservice to our young people when we give them these, these fake scenarios in their textbooks that seem to magically get resolved by the end of the unit. And that's not the real world. And so then they become disillusioned with, with the world and with our discipline. And so I think that um, just being more honest, right, is a part of it too. Like, you know, what, what Danielle was saying that science isn't gonna save us, like it plays a major role and if we could just start being more honest about the world that we are in, the world that we built and the world that we want, then I think we would do a lot more to um, getting the type of changes that we want to see. Yes, I think things don't happen in the vacuum in the way that we think that they do. Um, is there a question from our in-person audience? We will transition to another question. This. Oh, okay. Um, hi, I'm Orlando, uh, second generation Latino, and 
uh, in Panama. I've been here for six years now, and I work for CPS. And I'm from SEC, but I work for Central Office on the automatic rotation. <laughs> um, my question for you is how have each of you, and I've noticed during the pandemic, even before, how have each of you combated uh, science misinformation in the popular community? My favorites are Facebook and you know, WhatsApp. So here's how <laughs> Well, I'll just jump in really quickly because um, I, I think that I was, so I was doing the service learning work for Chicago Public Schools during the pandemic, and it was really important for us to um, create curriculum, right, that could be used remotely at that time. Um, and it was um, one of the things that was really important for me when I was designing curriculum was how much um, we ask students to talk to their families and their community members about their experiences in general with doctors, medicine, and vaccines, right? Um, there's a lot of mistrust and it's for a reason. And if we don't look at that and look at ourselves, then, then we're never gonna be able to move forward, right? And so um, Part of, I guess, part of what I'm going to say in that is like we have to be honest about why there there is mistrust and why there is misinformation in order to move towards, you know, combating that. I guess. So I, well, with, during the pandemic, I mean, I was teaching undergrads, and um, you know, and I was not already a, a board member, so I didn't know really how the school system was doing, but. Overall, I would say that even, you know, people that I know in my own communities or my own friends, when they were, have, when they were worried about, you know, the situation with vaccines or so forth, I think, that, again, as humans, the first thing we should do is listen, right? We all, and we all have worries and there is a reason for it. So we cannot just jump into conclusion and, and say, well, you know, you don't, you don't like to understand the science, et cetera. I think we all have to be listeners first before you can um, you know, even offer uh, resources. I think that's, and as, as you were saying, you know, it's, it's, there is a reason why people feel this way. They has the history about that. Uh, so I personally did not really have to be involved in mis uh, telling people about the, the situation, why, why they shouldn't believe or believe. But I, overall, I would say that whenever someone is in disagreement with me, my own or with whatever the information is going on, I was always asked why and pause and then analyze where they're coming from to be able to actually provide, you know, my comments. So, um, and I think it will go with any other situation, not just with the pandemic, but the pandemic actually showed us that some communities really were not comfortable with the situation. I really like both of those answers and what resonates with me across them is something I was going to mention too, which is having intellectual respect for people who have those misgivings or who are believing the misinformation, right? And, and understanding that it's tied to legit reasons for mistrust in some case, and also problematic and questionable politics in other cases. And so, you know, there's a there's an interesting article by a, a Mexican um, science educator named Liliana Valladares, where she she positions science, technology, and society education as a vaccine against misinformation, right? And I like that analogy. And basically what she's saying is just teaching people the science won't ever work because people have to understand how the institutions of science function in order to understand how they come up with technologies and then turn those technologies into products. And so part of it too is what I was saying earlier too about we have to be honest and this is part of giving people intellectual respect too. We have to be honest about the, how the STEM enterprise operates, right? So we can we can trust people to hold in their head at the same time that like Johnson and Johnson, one of the developers of the vaccine, maybe not the best one, but one of the developers of the vaccine could do something good like develop a vaccine and do something bad like have a major role in the opioid crisis, right? Or that Pfizer, one of the developers of one of the better vaccines also held Latin American countries at ransom pretty much to try to maximize their profit before they would make the vaccine available right outside the United States. And so people can deal with that complexity and that allows them to confront some of their misgivings and mistrust because we shouldn't just trust Pfizer, right? But we shouldn't become so cynical and that we, we fail to believe 
the clear evidence that the vaccine is safe and effective, right? And so I think allowing people to have those complex views and even encouraging them and prompting them to deal with the complexity of the way science operates in our world instead of kind of dismissing them as, as not understanding, uh, as Giselle was saying, I think, I think that's important. Thank you. Are there any other questions from the audience? Okay. So I kind of want to dial back a little bit and talk about one of the central themes of tonight's program, which is Latinidad. Um, in today's program description and in Teresa's remarks, we talked a little bit about Latinidad and how this identity is a fraught one. Can the panel speak a bit about the subject of Latinidad and the issues that arise from trying to homogenize a large group of people, both politically and culturally? We are silent because that's so complex, right? <laughs> <laughs> no one wants to. I mean, I was reading today uh, an article about the, you know, the complexity of uh, so many things, right? Like when you look at, uh, there was an, a report from um, one of the big companies that does uh, consulting, I think it's McKinsey, 2021, when they actually analyzed the, uh, the number of uh, people in, in, who are Latinos and are in, um, in high level management positions or leadership positions, right? So you will see, um, you know, the discrepancy across um, across the board. And, you know, you, you start with a lot of Latinos in different positions, but really very few that ev eventually rise up. So there's, there's a lot of complexity there and reasons why, uh, who knows, right? Every time you read an article, you find another reason. So I, I don't think there is a um, just one simple solution to this. I think it is, I think that what we have to do as Latino community is continue in supporting each other, understanding the issues that our students are facing and our communities are facing. Um, and my motto is move forward always, never giving up. Um, but uh, as Daniel said, really understand, be smart about, you know, making decisions and smart about understanding where the problems are coming, um, li listening to different perspectives, right? Because everyone has a perspective and everyone has an experience. Um, I guess I'll add really quickly um, that I think that, you know, just like you you mentioned, it's it's this complexity, right? And, and I think that as a teacher, a lot of the times we want to simplify things because we think like that's just gonna help people learn. And sometimes I, I think we, we've done a disserving the service maybe in some ways because maybe there's this underlying thing that people are convinced of that complexity is bad, that messiness, somehow like not having clarity instead of it being the exact opposite that a complexity and messiness actually helps us see the world more as it really is. And so I think um, when I think about my own teaching, right, just because I was teaching in a Latino community or I was teaching in my own community. I've never assumed that like, I know what Latino parents want because, you know, I, I live in the, even, because, even as living in the community and having children at that school. Um, and similarly in teaching, just because a student might look like me doesn't necessarily mean that um, we're going to even like the same music. Right. Um, so I, I think, um, I would say from a teaching perspective, education perspective, how can we continue to sort of instead sort of shift towards embracing complexity, making room for it, um, making room for difference, right? Because I think ultimately that's what it comes down to. We've maybe at a point now where we've been convinced that this sort of universalism is a good way to, to manage being in the world. And we're, we're starting to come up against this idea that difference is actually good um, and it's nourishing and it's um, and so how could we in our different roles sort of re-embrace difference as a positive thing right I think um, the Zapatistas talk about un mundo donde quepan muchos mundos right so how can we continue to to be different and to be prosperous because of our difference um, I think for me one of the really important things to remember is that racial, ethnic identities and groups and social groups in general are socially and historically constructed and they change over time, right? And so the notion of Latinidad, you know, 
clearly is an outgrowth of the complexity of, you know, European coloni colonialism in general, but Spanish um, and Portuguese um, colonization of these continents in particular, right? And so, you know, from that really brutal and complex process and also from the amazing resilience and thriving of the African and indigenous peoples who fought back throughout that process comes a lot of complexity um, and that the way those things position people in society over these last 500 years is constantly changing. And we have to be attentive, I think, to um, the ways those changes can fracture or create space for solidarities and for us to position ourselves um, on the side of, as folks have said, sort of progress in unity and um, pushing back against the forces of white supremacy and colonialism and imperialism that are responsible for the negative um, forces that we see as a result of that history. I was going to make a comment on that too as well. So I, I have three kids and my youngest um, was very worried when he went to school and he said, I don't want to speak Spanish. I don't want to be different. I don't want, I want to change my name from Anton, Antonio to Anthony. And so it was, you know, for us, it was very hard to admit, right, to, to listen to him. But then we said, well, I mean, he lives in us in us in an area that we are actually one of the few. So we, we have to work with him to make sure that he was that that he felt that being different is nothing wrong. That being different is actually something good. And so I think I, th I think many times um, we keep we talk about, you know, Latinos and Latinos and sometimes many of them feel very uncomfortable. I feel super comfortable. I love to be Latinos. I like to dance. I like my music. I like everything, <laughs> right? I, I embrace people, but not everyone feels this way. So I think respecting the differences is really something that we all have to strive for. Thank you, Thank you very much. Uh, now shifting a little bit um, onto the topic of mentorship, uh, someone from our online audience asks, how did mentorship or lack of impact your pathway in the sciences? How does this influence the way that you mentor? I can't speak the whole night about that. <laughs> Actually, um, well, I believe my personal life, I, if I had not had my mentor in high school that really pushed me hard, um, I probably have stayed in Costa Rica and having a really good time in the winter time, right? Um, and but I think really um, these people who believe in you, those people who take the time um, not just to advise you, but to find ways for you to to excel, to uh, encourage you to move forward, to sponsor you, um, there is is priceless. I think they open doors to you, and um, to me, is it's imperative that everyone seek mentorship at their own comfort, right? Not everyone is comfortable uh, with the men, you know, I think there's so many types of mentorship and all of us will find a way that we, you know, find the mentors that are right for us. Um, and so I believe that, especially in the, um, so one of the things that the Hispanic Lab does is that we reach out to students that are very young, fourth grade, five grade. And that's why, you know, starting that young age, they, they feel that they can have people that can kind of can can reach out to, um, and so I think this 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 situation where you know that someone is there for you, it is very very important, especially for students who don't have families who can actually help them out. So that's my experience personally as a mentor, as a mentee. You always benefit from from both being a mentor, being a mentee. Um, I cannot emphasize, I mean, at all levels, no matter how senior you are, you still need that support. I, I think it, it, Alejandro and I have, were talking before about whether, like in some, if you look at the literature, right, on like STEM persistence, in some ways we're considered levers um, 
because we kind of left a STEM trajectory for an education one. Now in other ways, we're not because we both finished degrees in chemistry, right? So um, we kind of sit in this in-between space and this question and your response made me think about how like, when I was studying, I started as a material science and engineering major in college and I shifted to chemistry once I, want, I knew I wanted to teach. And I had really awesome, strong mentors in education who were teachers. Um, a physics teacher named Kei Wen Yang and an English teacher named Jeff Duncan Andrade, who really showed me the transformative power of teaching. And I definitely didn't have anything like that in my chemistry or engineering classes. I never got to know any of my professors or any buddy, you know, I kind of tolerated those classes. I did well um, in terms of grades, but I didn't have um, mentorship in the same way. And I'm not, I'm not saying that in like a regretful way, because absolutely, I know I'm doing what I need to be doing as an educator. Um, I guess that's, that's the end of the reflection. <laughs> <laughs> um. You know, I think I'll piggyback a little off of what, what Daniel was just saying um, in that I think I, I can't think of having had a science mentor myself either. Um, in fact, I was reflecting as I thought about the remarks, there was a moment where I was a little darker <laughs> in my thinking and was really reflecting on how science courses actually were barriers and obstacles to me getting the degree and the things that I wanted. Um, largely due to instructors who really had super low expectations of me, who, you know, created situations in which I felt a lot of disrespect. Um, and, I, and I think that it was just more like that commitment to like, I'm gonna finish this because it just feels like everybody wants me not to, you know, that, <laughs> that, that, that kind of kept me going. Um, I would say most of the people that really kept me going when I was younger were my peers. My mentors were probably my peers. We were probably each other's biggest support systems, um, which is why I think I was a lot more involved in political activity, a lot of like Latino organizing. Um, and even as a science teacher, right, prefer to think of my work as cooperative and co-construction rather than an individual achievement, because I, I, I think that most of how I navigated university and that later has been in collectives together, but but I, I unfortunately don't have a lot of um, people I can think to in the sciences that that mentored that that, that formed that for me, you know. Thank you. And unfortunately we are over time, but I will risk uh, one more question and one answer. So if there's one question from the audience, last question, that would be amazing. Okay, there's no more questions, then can we please uh, give a thank you to our panelists? Thank you again to all of you for joining us tonight. Thank you so much to our wonderful panelists for sharing your insight and lived experiences in a way that allowed us to have open and critical conversations about what it means to be Latina in STEM. Thank you again to Horizon Therapeutics for sponsoring tonight's program. Thank you to Teresa Jorge for their opening remarks. Join us on September 24th for our bio blitz at Birds, Bikes, and Bee at Big Marsh Park. Our next inclusiveness and STEM event for our suburban audience will be held at Wabanzi College's Latinx Resource Center in Aurora on October 18th. Please evaluate today's session at c2st.cnf.io. It really does help us get feedback uh, and be entered to win a gift card. To support more programs like this one, donate at c2st.org and consider giving $15 in celebration of our 15th year. Sign up for a weekly C2ST newsletter to stay up to date on what's happening in STEM. Thank you so much again.